Well, hello and uh, good day to the uh, Durango Botanical Society and uh, in particular uh, Bill and all the hard work he's put together on putting this together. Um, I'm honored to present to you uh, today a uh, life on a family farm and uh, impacts uh, we're facing today from climate change. Uh, Bill and I had talked about trying to have tours out on the farm and uh, Unfortunately, uh, that's not possible today, but we hope to be able to do that in the future. Uh, but we'll do the second best thing today, which is uh, uh, tell a story and show you some pictures. So with that, I'm going to try to share a screen here and I'll jump right in. Um, let's see if I'm savvy enough to do this. Okay, so uh, this is a story about a uh, 21st century multi-generational farm uh, in a time of changing climate. Uh, again, our family uh, moved to Southwest Colorado four years ago. We moved from the Central Mountains. Uh, we had a small 17 acre farm up uh, in the Roaring Fork Valley in between Carbondale and uh, Vale, kind of up near Cottonwood Pass. And uh, we thought we would take that to a larger scale. Uh, we decided to move down here because both our kids uh, live here, went to Fort Lewis, worked for the same firm or did work for the same firm. And, uh, but the uh, decision makers, we have a new granddaughter and we decided to live with our granddaughter. A uh, 200 acre farm is what we purchased. It's called the Deep Creek Ranch. It is on the other side of the La Plata Mountains, about 30 miles as the crow flies to the northwest. Uh, we're just simply in the foothills uh, on the other side of the La Plata Mountains. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what it takes to be an economically viable farm or ranch, family farm in today's world. Uh, were a lot of corollaries, similarities to what we're doing. And, and if you saw the film, uh, The Biggest Little Farm, if not, I would encourage you to watch it. It's, it's fun. We have three generations on the farm. Before we moved to the uh, farm, uh, we did a lot of research. Uh, we researched by visiting and doing tours on farm. We kept asking people in the Roaring Fork Valley, uh, North Fork Valley, and the Gunnison Valley, you know, who's the successful farmers in your area? And uh, rather than take an academic or uh, uh, read about that, we decided to uh, interview people. And we came away with some uh, knowledge and some themes of what makes them successful. I'll share some of those with you. Uh, the first is that uh, people are not following traditional ag practices. There's a trend away from that. Traditional ag practices use the hydrocarbon inputs of uh, fertilizers, uh, herbicides, and pesticides uh, to the point there's no biology left in the soil. Uh, there's no nutrients that are being uptaken by plants and food and produce and livestock. And so as a result, a lot of our food is not very nutrient dense uh, anymore. Uh, uh, we learned uh, to do a lot more with less. Uh, we had learned the importance of soil, soil biology, the inputs of sun, water, plants, and livestock. Uh, we learned a lot about rotational intensive mob grazing, which is what we're going to do uh, on our ranch, and we are doing right now. Uh, the economics are very challenging. Um, we also learned the importance of uh, value-added products instead of commodities. Uh, if you make a value-added product like a cider or a wine or a specialty dairy product or rugs from sheep or alpacas and you do a very good job of it, there's a market for it. Uh, but there isn't a good sustainable market for commodities, things like corn and soybeans and uh, beef cattle, things like that. 
Uh, there's a trend of agritourism because many people from uh, more urban areas uh, have a dream or a vision of <clears throat> living on a small farm and uh, seeing what, what it takes and learning and uh, having mentorships with young uh, uh, farmers. So some pictures of our farm ranch. Uh, we again are at the foothills, the base of the La Plata Mountains. Are, these are 13,000 foot peaks. This is taken from the deck of our uh, uh, small log house. Um, and there's a commonality when you see the next two or three pictures and it's that when you look at the La Plata Mountains, you're looking at not only your irrigation water, but you're looking at your drinking water supply for the following year. And so you constantly dwelling, looking at the mountains because you can see exactly where it's coming from. Uh, this is again, a picture of the La Platas. This is uh, in May, you can see how green it is. Uh, and we haven't started to irrigate yet. Um, we have five ponds on the property, which were already there and each one of those is instrumental in being used as a tool for saving water, storing water uh, for future use uh, during the season. Uh, another view, uh, we live in a pinion juniper, uh, ponderosa pine habitat, lots of oak brush. It's known as the Deep Creek Ranch. There's an incredibly deep uh, canyon of two creeks uh, with riparian habitat, which is a different world than up here on the mesa uh, where the fields are. Everything's in a conservation easement, um, so we're very restricted on what we can do uh, with, uh, with the farm. This is in the fall, uh, four weeks ago when we had some snow and which has since melted. Uh, we're still very much in a drought condition. This was in the winter of 2018, no snow in the La Plata Mountains. Uh, that gives you pause for the upcoming season. Another picture, we're at 7,100 feet, uh, no snow in, uh, this was late January. Um, we do, are fortunate to have great uh, sunsets and sunrises, uh, but again, the ever-present uh, snowpack or lack of snowpack in the uh, for our water supply. Uh, this was again four weeks ago. So a little bit about our farm. The best description is it's, uh, it's an old version of McDonald's farm. We do orchards, berries, vineyards, produce, fiber, sheep, alpacas, and you can see multiple livestock. Uh, my daughter does medicinal herbs. Um, we do agritourism. Uh, or starting to, uh, but in all of this, we couldn't do all of these things. And we've accomplished all of these things in the four years since we've been there. But we couldn't do this and irrigate at the same time. And the uh, former landowner uh, flood irrigated, which took a lot of time and was very inefficient. So uh, our water comes from the uh, La Plata Mountains uh, through a small reservoir called Bower Reservoir and a large project reservoir called Jack Jackson Reservoir. Good senior water rights, but not a lot of abundance of water. Uh, it's piped from Bower to our ranch and delivers 120 PSI to the upper end of the property. And that is an astoundingly high amount of pressure. Uh, we decided to put that pressure to work. Uh, the flood irrigation practice of our farm uh, was very inefficient. Um, it took about, a, when you applied 100 gallons of water, uh, only about 20 of it was uh, evapotranspired by the growing plants. Um, very inefficient, very wasteful. We also have native tree nurseries and shrubs and they're populating the uh, ranch with them. Uh, livestock, uh, of course, uh, chickens. Um, we have both eggs, birds, and meat birds. Um, uh, the 
this on the left is for our egg laying birds. They're all pasture raised. Uh, we have a uh, coop that has an electronic door that opens and lets them out in the morning and opens and brings them in in the evening. We have an electric fence because we have uh, lots of predators uh, from mountain lions to bears to coyotes to foxes to uh, red-tailed hawks and eagles and uh, skunks and raccoons and badgers and uh, so that's thus the electric fence, very effective. We also have two great white Pyrenees dogs that uh, protect all of our livestock. On the right is a chicken tractor, uh, very lightweight. We can put about 30 to 40 chickens uh, in the chicken tractor. We move that daily so they graze in a natural manner off of the insect life, the grasses, the forbs, the herbs, and uh, kitchen scraps. Uh, we have alpacas. We have a herd of uh, somewhere around 25 alpacas. Uh, they're a wonderful, docile, uh, friendly uh, livestock to have. Um, sheep, we, we have a type of sheep called a Dorfer sheep. Uh, this was uh, one of our first lambs uh, born in early April. Uh, baby alpacas are called crias and they're born ready to run uh, from predators like any uh, uh, like many animals that are prey animals. Uh, this is another Kriya. He's just hours old. This is what he looks like when he just first stands. This was taken when he first stood and you can see he's all legs but very mature looking. Uh, we do livestock uh, cattle, beef cattle. Uh, we are rethinking and changing our plans for cattle. We're looking at a more uh, different uh, uh, breeds of cattle that are more conducive to the intention, intensive, intensive rotational grazing concepts. Uh, this is the uh, shearing one of our alpacas. We share them once a year. This is called a shearing table. It, sandwiches them in the vertical position in these pads and then we flip them over. Uh, they actually like the process. It takes about two days to shear the 25 alpacas. This is what we make out of the uh, felt that is called from the alpacas. The kids make these beautiful rugs. Uh, very nappy, thick, warm. Um, you almost don't want to put them on the ground. You want to put them as a decoration on your wall. Uh, this is the uh, ranch crew, folks, uh, 21st century. Uh, this is my family. We are the labor on the ranch. We do all the work. Uh, I still work as an engineer now. Uh, I plan to uh, slow down at the end of this year and work more on the ranch and help the kids out. Uh, we do a lot with berries, uh, blueberries, raspberries, uh, blackberries, uh, black and red raspberries, uh, strawberries, and as you know, you need very acidic soil, so we amend the soil with lots of peat moss and uh, pine needles, and we use some uh, fertigation practices to keep the soil very acidic, very low pH. I do lots with the perennial uh, strawberry, we're still learning. Uh, this year we had a bumper uh, apricot crop and a very meager crop of apples, pears, peaches, cherries, uh, and plums. But we had a bumper crop of apricots even though we had lots of very hard frosts in, uh, up until late June. Uh, we uh, make uh, apricot jam, apricot preserves out of the apricots this year. We are planning to do a lot with hard cider. We've made a couple of batches the first last two years. Uh, this is our fourth year of the apple trees and next year they should, 100% of them should produce. Try to use some traditional hand uh, apple presses. <clears throat> We're fixing these old presses up. Newer version of a hand uh, apple press. 
Uh, we've, uh, again, we're experimenting with hard cider. Uh, we have about 120 apple trees uh, on the ranch that we planted uh, three years ago. Uh, most of which are the uh, heritage antique apple trees of Montezuma County. Uh, Montezuma County was known as the breadbasket of apples in the uh, early uh, 20th century. Uh, and a lot of the younger generation are putting them back to use. They've been neglected and not, uh, uh, not taken to full term and, and produced with, or producing uh, table apples or cider apples, but uh, uh, the younger generation is uh, restoring many of them and turning them into cider, and I think that's great. Uh, interesting, this was a apple tree that was thought to be extinct from Colorado, uh, but a group called the Montezuma Orchard Restoration Program, which I would highly encourage you to visit. Uh, is restoring all of the heritage fruit trees and from Montezuma County. We were lucky to have one and when this is more mature we'd like to do some grafting off of it as well. But we really, uh, most of our effort has been in uh, focusing on irrigation as a priority as a hedge against droughts, climate change, and a warmer climate. Uh, most people are familiar with this picture. This is us when we're flood irrigating when we flood irrigated first two years, a very romantic uh, vision of being out in the fields in the morning at sunrise and at sunset. But what you're literally doing is you're moving dirt with a shovel and causing water to go different directions and uh, you're using 1800s technology for a very precious commodity and very wasteful. So we researched many, many different technologies and came up with uh, uh, an irrigation system called uh, fixed set big guns. And <clears throat> this is about, there's 70 of these in the fields. They're fixed, they, they don't move. They're about four and a half feet tall. Uh, this is the sprinkler head. This is, uh, there's a, a diaphragm valve that's an open and closed valve uh, that turns these on and off. This is an air release valve pressure release valve, very high pressure, 120 PSI. And this is a control panel. Uh, we run these wirelessly off of a computer in our workshop. Uh, so we turn them on and off uh, with programs uh, that run uh, all the time. Uh, very little labor involved in running these. Uh, just some pictures. Um, each of the guns are spaced 400 feet apart. So they are literally shooting out 400 feet, uh, 100 GPM gallons per minute at about 110 to 120 PSI pressure, very high pressure. Um, and a couple things I'll show you, you can see the water pattern. It's like a fine mist. And that's very important to not damage grasses and things we grow. Um, again, 400 feet from here to here, and you can see, so we overlap between each gun to make sure we get good coverage. Again, you can see the fine mist and the pattern from the gun all the way to the, uh, from the beginning to the end. Uh, frosty fall morning with a little bit of snow in the Lopladas. Uh, this uh, movie is uh, showing the guns in action. Again, uh, I'm standing about 400 feet away. It's a little deceiving. And uh, I'm about to get wet. Uh, and you don't want to be in harm's way of these uh, big guns. Um, yep, I'm starting to get wet. Okay, some other things we're doing on the ranch. All of the uh, out of field uh, orchards and berries and medicinal herbs and produce nut trees uh, are all done with even more efficient systems with uh, the latest generation of, um, 
uh, tapes and micro sprayers and technology that was uh, perfected in uh, arid countries like Israel. Um, some lessons we've learned, uh, and I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, generally, the big guns are more efficient than the published tables. It's more than 80% efficient. Uh, and we found that the flood irrigation, just by contrast, was less efficient than published tables. Um, when you have a switch on a control panel that you can turn off and pause, uh, you can save a lot of water. And we do that all the time during the irrigation season. Uh, if it rains, when we're moving livestock through the fields, but we're always pausing the big guns. We try to run them only at night. Um, but when you have a flood irrigation ditch running, uh, you turn it on in May and, and you leave it on till the end of the season, oftentimes in uh, September and October, running full time. Uh, <clears throat> The other lesson learned is when you're not irrigating, you're spending more time with your customer, getting to know your market, um, and doing other on-farm things. This shows the comparison between flood irrigation in the orange, the use of water by month, and uh, versus the big guns in blue. Uh, you can see May through August, and then the total for the year. This was for the year 2019. First year we used this, we saved 61.4% uh, of our water. Imagine that saving uh, in the state of Colorado where 82% of the consumptive use of water is used by agriculture. Imagine the savings of water that can be used for other purposes, left in the rivers, left in the streams, if everyone became that efficient. Uh, just a few more pictures. Uh, this is a picture of my daughter's medicinal herbs in January. She starts them in the greenhouse in January. And then three or four months later, this is what they look like. Uh, you'll recognize these as California poppy, poppies, which have some kind of uh, medicinal property that I'm not sure. She probably has about 40 different varieties of uh, perennial uh, medicinal herbs. Uh, we dry them on these. We made these uh, drying bins uh, in the greenhouse uh, to dry. Uh, uh, daughter makes uh, salves and tinctures and oils. Uh, we sell a lot of them to doctors and physical therapists and uh, sports medicine folks, uh, natural paths and uh, health food stores. Uh, I'm always concerned about the impact of the changing climate drought uh, on our wildlife. We have an abundance of wildlife on the ranch. Uh, but there's no better bellwether than birds. And uh, you've heard the stories this year about uh, uh, mass fatality rates and strange acting birds and birds that have never shown up. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that that is all true. The bird life on this ranch is just off the charts. But this year, uh, this fall, we've had flocks of these uh, yellow-headed blackbirds. And they're still there. And we've never seen them before. Uh, and whether it's uh, the drought or the heat or the fires uh, in California and Colorado and throughout the West and the smoke, uh, they're migrating different. Uh, they're staying on the property at different times. Uh, all of a sudden, we had flocks of these pied grebes uh, show up on our ponds, and they're still there. Uh, but most interestingly, we had flocks of warblers that we've never seen before. This is a Wilson warbler. And they stayed around for about a month and a half, and we've never seen them before. They left just about two weeks ago when that uh, or when that big storm happened. Uh, and I think that a lot of them are getting caught up north and the colder weather and the lack of food is uh, uh, causing some of the mortality rate. Just some other fun things we're doing on the farm. Uh, these are pecan trees. Uh, I had planted about 15 of them last spring. I had a success rate of about 50%. Uh, the lesson I learned is I can't 
plant them down in low lying areas where the cool water pools. I need to get them up higher on the ridges. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, this is a, uh, an extinct American chestnut tree. Uh, planted 10 of those last spring, 70% uh, success rate. Uh, this one uh, actually is growing very well. Um, they, as you know, there were billions of um, American chestnuts uh, killed by the chestnut blight during the uh, uh, 19th and 20th century in the Midwest and the East Coast. Uh, but they found some trees that were immune from the blight and they crossed it with, uh, and I'm not sure I have the proper terminology, with some Chinese chestnut trees. And then they recrossed them back many times over to the American immune chestnuts. So they're essentially uh, extinct uh, American chestnuts. We are experimenting with them. We don't think the blight is out here. If it's successful, we can graft off of them and try to uh, or perpetuate the American chestnut tree. Uh, we do an apiary. Uh, my son and my son-in-law did that this year for the first time. Uh, here they are taking their first honeycomb and putting it in our centrifuge stainless steel container with a centrifuge that separates the uh, honey from the comb. I prefer to eat it directly off of the comb and I can tell you that the taste of this honey is unlike any honey you would buy in, in a store. Uh, you taste every single wildflower on the property. I'll get into the last slide. Uh, this uh, fall picture, you can see it's still a bit green just two weeks ago. None of this would be green without the use of small reservoirs. Um, and that will have to be a tool uh, in droughts and acclaimed changing climate. Uh, the world of big reservoirs is over. You won't be able to permit or build them. They're too expensive. But small reservoirs above your usage can be beneficial, uh, not only in providing irrigation water, but providing water back to streams late in the year when they're most, when they're at their driest. Uh, and that's it. Uh, this is uh, our success day of when we finally turned on our first big gun. It's my daughter and I, she's the genius behind all of this. And with that, uh, be happy to answer any questions you have and have a conversation at some point in time. And again, thank you. I'm honored to be able to speak to the uh, Botanical Society and I look forward to uh, joining your group and getting involved in what you do. And with that, I'm going to end our program. Uh, again, thank you very much.